Hello, welcome to another Tonalist Landscape Oil Painting Demonstration. This is your painter in residence, M. Francis McCarthy, and the painting I'm bringing you today is a demonstration of extreme glazing over this kind of study I did after Murphy that I really didn't like. I really hated his 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 sky, and you could tell by the way I painted it. So. Uh, I did it back in January. It's been sitting there <clears throat> for months until finally um, it occurred to me that the solution would be to abandon Murphy altogether. Um, what I did was actually, yeah, that's I did a little quick flash of it, and I'll give you. I don't mind giving you that uh, tip or insight. They're not all just in the members area. Speaking of, this is in the members area. It's about an hour. It's a really good one. Uh, because you're going to get a blow by blow of the colors I'm using. I, I will say that basically started with Indian yellow and went from there. But um, getting to what I was going to say, what I did is I took a picture with my phone of the painting with the um, boring um, sky. And in Photoshop, I took that picture and did some composites of some more interesting sort of skies and use that as reference to complete the painting and it was just you know pretty loose reference um, but it's good to have something to spark the imagination and this painting turned out really really good um, I'll be putting it in my upcoming show and what I'm calling this is a cover I'm calling this uh, it's not a study it's a cover so uh, imagine, uh, you know, um, say something like uh, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band by the Beatles done in the uh, style of a polka. Yeah, it's like that. It's a cover song, you know, but in a different uh, different vein. I completely, it's the first time I've ever done this too, completely just kind of uh, kept this composition, um, which I like. Now, interestingly, uh, about old Murphy um, was... Um, I think this is what one of his what uh, pot boiler a pot boiler being a, <clears throat> a work that you create just for money, and I'd heard there was a spate in a, a sort of an economic depression in the 1870s 1880s, um, and that he was just churning out paintings um, using a very similar um, composition and motif. Um, and I have seen several this way. Uh, this reference for this was so tiny, it was from an auction site. So it's hard to find good high res uh, re references of John Francis Murphy. He really should have books written about him. He was amazing. He's really one of the all time greats. And um, the fact that there's not an actual book out on John Francis Murphy, if I was more of a scholar, um, I would, I would. Be, you know who needs to write that is David uh, Cleveland, okay, the guy that did the uh, the uh, book on American tonalism, which if you don't have, go buy that. Buy it while you still can. It's in the second edition, which I imagine will sell out like the first. Um, there's a huge chapter on Murphy. Pretty much all you're going to learn about Murphy in the world of books. Um, there is not very little online either. I could tell you I've done lots of studies after Murphy, so very little there. Anyway, uh, let's talk about this painting. You want more more juice. So extreme glazing, uh, what do you do? I mean, well, first of all, you just reset the whole thing from the standpoint of starting off with some sort of extreme glaze. Um, in the old days, I didn't really have Indian yellow. Someone on the channel put me on to Indian yellow, and, and it was so nice they did because it's very strong. It's very chromatic. Um, so I started with that. Um, in the old days, I might have done uh, like a transparent earth red, which is also very strong, but would have been very red. What I liked about the Indian yellow is it just gave me this kind of golden tone. And you can see it was so powerful that you can see there's a little bit of a greeny cast down by the horizon. That's all going to go. It's all going to disappear. Um, from there, I have my standard, uh, I would say my standard golden palette, which would be... Oh, of course, cadmium yellow. I use a ton of cadmium yellow. You can see I've got a bunch squeezed out there in the palette. Cadmium orange, um, burnt sienna, alizarin crimson. Uh, I may have even had perylene red out for this. I think I had it on my palette. Perylene red being very much like uh, cadmium red, but transparent. 
great color to have around, especially if you're doing extreme glazing. Um, so we started with extreme glazing, but most of the work I'm doing here is... Uh, actually, it's not all completely opaque. Uh, I'm really riffing off of transparency buzz uh, quite a lot on this painting. I was able to get the tone set. Um, and this all, like I said, in the um, members area, it, you know, this all came together in about an hour. Um, and I was going to um, put it together with the original painting session, uh, which I think I will do in the members area. I'm probably going to just upload to uh, one that's got... God, this to me is truly the most interesting bit. Um, I felt that whole initial session was just a struggle and uh, I felt... Um, well, I didn't know. A lot of times, in fact, I mean, there's it's not a tip for you, but let's talk about studio practices, right? You know, you've got a painting you did you got it set in your little drawing area or whatever. You look at it, and every time you look at it, you kind of sigh. And you go, oh, I don't know about that one. You don't maybe completely hate it. I say if you do one you completely hate, take it out in the curb and break it into pieces and throw it away. <clears throat> That's satisfying to do that to a few paintings every year. Or, you know, another alternative if you're not that's if you really hate it. If you don't really, really hate it. Um, I had one I did recently. It was just a bad idea. Did a whole drawing. Didn't work out. And what I did was I um, I, um, I kind of scraped it down. And uh, um, then I went over the top of it with some oil paint uh, of a neutral tone, an earth tone. Um, I've already done a new drawing on top of that. And so it would be like the old painting never existed. At least until they, you know, x-ray it in the future if that happens and if it does they'll see well wow, look there's this bad thing underneath <laughs> that's actually a really good thing to do because that way you don't waste a board but sometimes you just gotta destroy it you get rid of it and I do recommend don't just throw it in the trash because what will happen is someone will fish it out and one day you'll go to somebody's house and you'll see your painting there your horrible painting that you hated uh, and there you go um, let's say that you're not going to do that though. Let's say you think it has some potential. It may be a candidate for extreme glazing. Um, which this is kind of a hybrid of extreme glazing here because um, um, it's the first time. Usually when I do extreme glazing I just throw an extreme glaze on. I'm kind of lost. I've got no reference and I just make it all work. Um, this is the first time uh, where I really um, decided oh I'll take a shot with my phone, do some a little quick compositing with an alternative sky since I, I reckon it was a sky and not just a sky I mean, it was a blah of colors all this gray and, and uh, icky white and icky greens and it's uh, just nasty uh, boring you know there ain't nothing boring about the one we're doing now it's exciting and uh, as sunsets are that's why we love them right um, but uh, you know that candidate I do recommend giving it a little time though so don't 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 try and get it. well. First of all, to do extreme glazing, you've got to work with a painting that's 100% dry. So, let's say you got your failed painting. Um, you know, it's it's failed. Uh, you hit it with a good coat of liquid when, when that's dry. Um, let that get good and dry, um, and then you can you can start off by just rubbing some uh, bright glaze over the top, and then you're kind of like, whoa, what do I do now? which is a great place to be. I mean, uh, for me, I usually know what I'm going to do. I'm going after things, and I have some sort of idea how they're going to turn out. But many times when I'm taking that approach, I have no idea. I don't, I don't know how things are going to go. And that is exciting, and it's a good. And I, I, I've got uh, more, failure, more successes and failures um, doing that. Um, and I will say there has been times I've gone after that, and uh, it just didn't pan out. And... Um, uh, what I did was I just took a little bit of mineral spirits and washed off all the extreme glazing and then um, uh, actually in that particular case I did nothing because it was just a bad composition there was nothing I could do for it but it's good to know you can you can roll it back roll it back 
Oh yeah, I don't think I finished all that. I do have some, um, one of the things I'm doing is I'm coming with some ochres. So it's not just your ready oranges and stuff. You got your ochres, which aren't, of course, not green colors, but they're more greenish than um, the cadiums by quite a ways. So I thought it was a good idea to bring in some of these ochres that in the horizon and it just gave it a little bit more complexity. Um, and the end result was quite quite a, a nice beautiful painting and uh, maybe uh, definitely I think uh, uh, nicer than the original uh, Murphy which you know I, I, uh, I don't have um, was an inspired painting and oh one of the things David Cleveland had said about that I mean one of the reasons I know about these pot boilers of uh, Murphy's is that he says that's one of the things he felt really impacted Murphy's um, legacy was all these paintings were sort of like copies of each other very very similar compositions where you know who knows what he sold it for maybe he sold it for 20 bucks back in the day so his family could have a you know dinner you know this was a different time a different world uh, as modern so it barely even resembles the time we live in you know we're getting uh, we're over saturated with images all day long all day every day um, coming in from the phones, coming from the computer, coming in from the television. Um, and some of the imagery is amazing and beautiful. Uh, I think we become inured to it, you know, we just become blasé about it. Uh, so many times you see in shows where people are, or, or uh, videos like on YouTube, where you see people's environments, they don't even have art on the wall, you know, and probably because they're getting enough visual uh, stimulation off of their phones and their televisions and their computer screens I imagine I don't know but uh, back in the day back in the 1800s if you wanted a color image it would you were pretty much painting it um, that was about the same time that um, you know various forms of lithography were advancing and uh, color reproductions were um, somewhat available but but not really in the realm of affordability for most people. Most people would like, you know what they would do? They would be like cutting etchings out of books and putting those up on the walls. And those, of course, are black and white. Etchings, engravings, you know what I mean. You know, this uh, it was the great age of illustration, I would say, the 1880s on up through the uh, early 20th century. and and even in further um, really before color photography kicked in um, and even before more advanced forms of black and white photography you know um, you wanted something and you wanted it to look good you hired an artist and he illustrated it um, and those were the good old days I guess hey anyway getting kind of close to the end uh, thank you for uh, joining me today I know well we have another minute um, hopefully you got something out of this. I think this is a pretty wonderful little demonstration to share and um, you know why not just riff off of uh, Murphy he's gone he's dead and he's barely remembered um, you know I'm, I've, I've always hoped one of my fondest hopes is that um, that me doing studies after uh, John Francis Murphy and Charles Warren Eaton is helping to bring some awareness to these um, great artists that are pretty much forgotten. You got your George Ness, everyone knows about Ness. Um, he was the cream of the cream. But these guys were just just barely below him, really. I mean Murphy is some has done paintings that that definitely um I'll put it this way, no one has rivaled Ness's greatest works, but certainly Murphy um has done as well as uh and this is, you know, second tier after that, I'll tell you that. And there's plenty of Murphys out there. I mean, plenty of Vanessas out there that are, you know, not very good, kind of dogs, you know. So, he's a great painter. He deserves a lot more credit. Hopefully someday someone will write a book. And maybe it'll be because they saw a YouTube video from M. Francis McCarthy. And they go, wow, who's this artist? He's doing a study after. This is amazing. You know, that would be great. I think it'd be great. And so, for that reason, I don't think John's going to mind me riffing off his uh, pot boiler. I had fun. I think I made a saleable painting. I think it's exciting now. And uh, I really feel good about the whole process. And um, hopefully, you got something uh, pretty groovy from it, too. 
and you can do your own experimenting. Well, who says we can't treat paintings doing studies after masters like um, people treat doing cover songs of established musical artists? What is the difference, right? Hmm. Anyway, until I come back with another video for you, and thank you so much for being here today. Check out the members area. Support this artist. Thank you. Um, and while you're doing all that, do me a favor. Do me a solid. Take good care of yourself, your family, your loved ones. Be patient with people that annoy you. And uh, stay out of trouble.